Ukraine will win when there's an economic or political collapse inside of Russia. We don't know when that date will occur, but when it starts to happen, things are going to move very fast. If Donald Trump is elected in November, he will pull the United States out of out of NATO. He won't take office until like June 20, uh, January 20th. But the second he takes office, he's going to tell the Pentagon, stop providing intelligence, stop providing training, stop providing support. It doesn't matter if Congress allocated funds. If Donald Trump becomes commander in chief of the military, he says, like he says this week, he's going to purge all the top generals, replace them with people loyal to him who will do whatever he says in violation of federal law and the Constitution. Donald Trump is a dictator. He wants to be a dictator. And the second he gets into office, the first thing he's going to do is kill Ukraine. This is a conversation with Jake Bro. Jake served as the nuclear and missile operations officer in the US Air Force, and today he runs one of the largest YouTube channels on the war in Ukraine, providing daily commentary and analysis. In this conversation, we talked about why Jake is sure that if Donald Trump becomes the US president, he will leave NATO, the incompetence of the Russian military, or what will the end of Putin's regime look like? Thank you to everyone who supports this podcast on Patreon. And now, enjoy the conversation. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So I think most people who are listening to this right now probably know you as, you know, one of the most popular online commentators um, on the war in Ukraine, if I can put it that way. And I definitely want to talk about that. But before we get to that, you do have quite an interesting background that I think um, I would like to talk about as well, because you served as a nuclear and missile operations officer in the U.S. Air Force. And to me, that's a position that I imagine um, as you um, sitting in a bunker somewhere deep underground with your hand on a big red button waiting for uh, a call to come to start a nuclear war. Um, and I think that would be a good way to start if you could maybe correct uh, me in my imagination of what your job was and talk a little bit about your background in the military. And then how did you get to doing what you do now, which is basically running one of the largest platforms that informs people about the war um, that's out there? So I served six years as a nuclear missile operations officer. Uh, I was a launch officer for the Minuteman III Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System. That's the land leg of the nuclear triad for the United States and their nuclear forces. Uh, I was stationed in Minot, North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota it's pretty cold, pretty pretty far north. It's along the Canadian border. And uh, while living in Minot, it's a, it's a relatively small town. I was looking for something to do, a, a new hobby to pick up. I was watching um, finance and investing videos to better understand how to manage my, my paycheck. And I watched a video from Graham Stephan saying how to get your first 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. And I just took it as a personal challenge. This was back in early 2019. So I started a YouTube channel just to entertain myself, to challenge myself. Uh, and I was making two or three videos a week while doing my regular job in the Air Force. I enjoyed it. I didn't have any expectations that I would ever hit 100,000 subscribers or anything crazy like I'm doing now. Uh, but I did get to a point after doing it for about two years um, where I thought, what if I could get out of the military and just do YouTube, do this full time? So uh, I decided to separate from the Air Force. This was February of 2022. Uh, I officially separated the same week that Russia launched the full scale invasion of Ukraine. At the time, I was talking about finance and investing topics, uh, but I made like this one off video just given my background. And this was the number one news story in the world. That video got like three times my normal views. The algorithm rewards you, you know, when, when you get a spike in, in, in viewership, you think, okay, maybe I should talk about that again. So I, I spent like two months alternating between the topics, but eventually my channel doubled in size and I realized more people were watching me 
for news updates than for finance updates. So I eventually just committed to this path. And I mean, I've, I've been doing it two and a half years now, and I've probably made close to 500 videos in support of Ukraine. Do you ever miss the military? Because I imagine this is probably as different of a career as it could possibly be from what you were doing before. I think for a lot of uh, U.S. service members who separate, they'll probably give the same answer I'm about to give you. But uh, I, I miss the people. I miss the structure. I don't miss the job. Uh, the job as a launch officer was very difficult. I would deploy to the field um, either for 36 hours or seven days at a time. Uh, and and <laughs> the way you described it is pretty accurate. You're, you're just sitting underground in a, we call it a capsule. Uh, but yeah, you're just sitting there waiting for an order from the president to launch. And then you've got keys and switches. Uh, so uh, the work was difficult. I, I didn't want to do, like, I physically didn't want to do the job anymore, staying up all night. Uh, but, um, but yeah, the people and the structure and the benefits. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really appreciated my time in the U.S. Air Force. Moving to what you're doing now, we sometimes hear that people in the West, in Europe and in, in the U.S., as the time goes on, um, lose interest or, or, or maybe getting a bit tired with the war. Do you feel that from your position is the case? Uh, for most Americans, uh, they've already made up their minds. They either think Russia is the aggressor, Ukraine is the victim, uh, and Ukraine should be supported, or you know, some crazy 20% thinks Russia's the good guys and they're just trying to defend themselves against an aggressive NATO. There's no new information that needs to be presented after two and a half years where people are going to change their mind. But I think uh, emotionally, people can't stay invested every single day, comparable to how Ukrainians have to. Uh, maybe Ukraine's immediate neighbors, they have to. You, you, this is their land, their territory. They're being attacked. They have to remain engaged every day, unfortunately. But, you know, 5,000 kilometers away here in the United States, You can, get, you can get along just fine not paying attention to the war every single day. So the average American is focused on other world events, other issues, local issues. Uh, but if you do ask them, what's your thoughts on Vladimir Putin? Most people are going to have a negative opinion, but they're not, they're not looking for new information two and a half years into this war. So it's not so much a fatigue. It's just like a coping mechanism for the average person. They're constantly, all day, every day, being bombarded with news and information, and the mind has a way of compartmentalizing. But I don't, I don't see the poles shifting in any way, even though, yes, two and a half years into the war, a lot of people have disengaged and they're not paying attention to the day-to-day -day events. You've mentioned the 20 or so percent of people who, who have an affinity for Russia and, and for Vladimir Putin. What are your thoughts or views on that? And how do you explain that to yourself? And maybe for um, someone who's not an American like me and, and many of my viewers, how important do you think that this feeling is within the U.S.? For This is not just for people in America, but for people across the world. You know, for people who cheer and support for Russia in the Middle East or Africa or East Asia or South America, they don't actually care about Russia. They're not exactly pro-Russian. They're anti-American, anti-British, anti-French. It, it's, it's not difficult to just give historical examples of things that colonial powers did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, whatever. And they view Russia as a counterbalance. Uh, big, big, big geopolitics. A lot of people think a unipolar world in which the United States is a lone hegemon is a problem. And they want a counterbalancing force. Doesn't matter how evil it is. Doesn't matter if it's the Russians. They just think, and there are, there are political scientists that advocate this, that it's a, it's a better world, a safer world, if there's two or three superpowers that keep each other in check. There is a certain level of persuasion to that argument, uh, but Russia's not it. 
when you see these videos of Russian soldiers dying horribly in these meat assaults in Ukraine, nobody cries for these soldiers. Nobody cares about these soldiers. The people who cheer on Russia don't care about casualties. The, their attitude is, well, if they were on the front lines in Ukraine, then their, their life probably isn't worth much. Putin is protecting the people that should be protected. And it's the convicts and the prisoners and, you know, the, the, the degenerates and the drug addicts being sent to the front lines. But specifically here in the United States, Donald Trump says this. Donald Trump last week said, the Chinese are not our enemies. The Russians are not our enemies. The real enemies are the Democrats, liberals, the FBI, the justice system. Like it's to me, this is shocking and insane that Trump is undermining, you know, the institutions of American democracy. He says the 2020 election was rigged. So there are a lot of people in the United States who are Donald Trump supporters cheering on Russia because they think that somehow hurts the Democrats, that somehow hurts Joe Biden. Russia has managed to trick and confuse people to think you know, we're on your side for your own domestic political fighting issues or whatever. And as an American, I'm I'm shocked and outraged that other Americans would be looking to outside powers, the Chinese and the Russians for help in our own domestic battles over abortion or gun rights or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I, I hate this. I absolutely hate what's happening now with American politics and what Donald Trump is doing. And it's to me transparent. Uh, so I hope I explained that well, but it's a battle the next five months leading into this November election. A lot is at stake. I don't want to get too deep into the U S politics, but before we move on to um, the, the present and future of the war in Ukraine, what are your views on um, Donald Trump and the potential of him becoming the president um, later this year. How do you think that would shape the U.S. support for Ukraine and, and the wider relationships uh, between the U.S. and NATO or the mem future of the U.S. NATO membership? If Donald Trump is elected in November, he will pull the United States out of out of NATO. He won't take office until like June 20, uh, January 20th. But the second he takes office, he's going to tell the Pentagon stop providing intelligence, stop providing training, stop providing support. It doesn't matter if Congress allocated funds. If Donald Trump becomes commander in chief of the military, he says, like he says this week, he's going to purge all the top generals, replace them with people loyal to him who will do whatever he says in violation of federal law and the constitution. Donald Trump is a dictator. He wants to be a dictator. And the second he gets into office, the first thing he's going to do is kill Ukraine and help Vladimir Putin win this war. Sure, Congress could pass laws or resolutions, but half the Congress is Republican and they're just going to do whatever Donald Trump says. Sure, somebody could take Trump to court, but I don't have faith in our Supreme Court anymore. Uh, the stars are lying. If people in America choose to vote for Donald Trump, uh, Fascist, fascism will, will, will reign in the United States. And uh, this is not a good sign for Ukraine or for, for the Western alliance in Europe. Well, um, I mean, that's hard to come up with an answer to something like that. I, I'm using very shocking language and shocking rhetoric because Donald Trump is a very silly person objectively. His stupid hair, his stupid skin, his stupid way of speaking. Uh, so it's disarming. You know, people look at this 77 year old obese man who can't even make complete sentences and they think this is the guy he's gonna do it but uh it's a cult and people who support trump love him unconditionally it doesn't matter what he says and does um so i mean i i pray that he doesn't win in november but this is a very serious possibility everyone needs to wake up and take this serious i think we don't really hear it Put, put it as straight as you just did. So uh, to be honest, it uh, threw me off balance a little bit hearing you say it like that. Um, I guess I, I just hope that we will not have to um, find out the hard way. Um, but maybe moving away from the US politics and towards 
the war in Ukraine. I'd like to take a little step back first and look at the past basically um, two years, four months at this point of the war. And since you've been following it every day and analyzing it every day since the war began, if you look back now at the over two years, what are some of the things that surprised you the most in sort of a big reflection of what we've seen so far and that you perhaps did not expect would happen the way they did? I guess two things, and they're both related. One, that the Russian military so horribly underperformed, given their size and their advantages and their prestige. I mean, the opposite side of Russia underperforming is Western intelligence failures about how overestimated the Russian military was. You know, uh, the United States intelligence apparatus was telling President Biden, if Russia invades, it'll last three days. We should send in the helicopters and get President Zelensky and his family out because the Ukrainians have no chance of defending the capital city of Kyiv. Russia will take it. That was the consensus amongst all Western intelligence agencies. And they got it wrong, horribly wrong. So yes, the failure of Western intelligence agencies uh, to just comprehend the level of incompetence and corruption from the Russian military. And yeah, even I'm shocked at how corrupt and incompetent the Russian military is. They can't do anything. When you actually get out a ruler and measure how far they've gone in the Donetsk Oblast, 24 kilometers, two and a half years of fighting, hundreds of thousands of people dead, and the Russian military has advanced 24 kilometers towards their objective of taking the entirety of the Donetsk Oblast. I don't know how anyone can look at those basic facts and not be shocked at how bizarre this is. Like, nobody could have predicted this outcome, that Ukraine would have performed so well defending their land, defending their people two and a half years ago. So I I, I think people are still making the same mistake. They're still constantly overestimating the Russians and not just looking at the facts today of how poorly they performed and then said, well, Russia's not going to do better in the future. I mean, if, if, if with every advantage they had going into this, they're still struggling today. I don't see how Russia's ever going to turn this around. So let's give let's give Ukraine everything they need to win this war today. I, I think it's quite interesting because there are these sort of two opposing views of, of Russia or specifically the Russian military that you've hinted at. And that on one hand, we sort of tend to see it as this or sometimes tend to see it as this unstoppable war machine. And on the other hand, sometimes we tend to see Russian military as like a a bunch of bumbling um, idiots who are completely incompetent. And it seems to me like you would probably lean more towards the latter view. But I would say, and I've heard it from quite a lot of senior Russia experts and analysts, that there's a danger of underestimating Russia. And perhaps that sometimes might lead to a complacency in um, how we treat the whole issue. If we see Russians as incompetent, we tend to expect that the that winning the war will be easy and that sometimes leads to um, not giving Ukraine the support that they would need. Well, when when giving forecasts, you give two different kinds of forecasts into the future. There's the forecast of what if we do nothing and we don't help Ukraine? That's the doomsday scenario. Russian tanks go all the way to Portugal. You know, if 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 Russia can take over Ukraine, mobilize the men, absorb their resources, yeah, Putin's going for the Baltics next. That's the forecast if we do nothing. But the forecast of if we help Ukraine, we send in trainers and expertise and give them the weapons, then Russia can't win. Russia's never going to win this war. So I do both. I give both forecasts, the doomsday scenarios of Russia achieving all of their wildest dream objectives, reconstituting the Russian empire, the United States retreats across the Atlantic, 
The Russians get to take control of all of Europe, which is what Joseph Stalin wanted to do after World War II. Um, but then, yeah, there's the other scenario of Russia's beatable. Russia is entirely beatable. We're just see- the dramatic change on the battlefield over the last two months since the United States Congress passed the 61 billion supplemental. I mean, the Russians took Avdivka. The Russians were having this salient breakthrough near Ocheretny. Everybody was saying the Ukrainians are doomed. And all we did was give them some extra artillery shells and Gimler's rounds. And the Russians haven't advanced anywhere on the map in almost a month. Russia's beatable. Let's do it. What's your view of the situation at the moment? Because you've you've hinted at it, but basically, if you can give me your sort of high level assessment or analysis, looking at basically what we now see as as the failed uh, Kharkiv offensive, how do you see the balance of power between the two sides uh, as it has been for the past few weeks? and maybe your forecast into the coming months? I think both Ukraine and Russia have accepted this is a war of attrition. And they're only going to win the war through their own definition of winning if the other side can politically and economically collapse. So Russia is going after Ukraine's uh, thermal power plants. They're, They're trying to send Ukraine back to the dark ages. And Ukraine is going after Russia's oil refining industry Uh, go after their money supply. (laughs) I saw this headline on Twitter the other day, but the price, the price of potatoes in Russia have got, has gone up 46% year to date. So just in the last six months, potatoes in Russia have gone up 46%. So Russians feel it at the grocery store. My high level assessment of how does Ukraine win? How does this war end? And it'll end when Russians can no longer, on their salary, go to the grocery store and even buy food. The economic situation is so bad. Inflation is so bad. We're not there yet. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the analysis that nobody wanted to admit two and a half years ago. But Russia is only going to lose this war when they run out of money. And two and a half years ago, Russia had a wealth fund. Putin had saved up money to fight this war, $600 billion worth. Half was frozen in Western banks because Putin's an idiot. He didn't tell his advisors he was going to do this. So you look at $300 billion and two and a half years ago, people were saying, that's a lot of money. You know, a, a, a dollar goes farther in Russia based on what they pay for stuff. But now that we're two and a half years into this war, how much of that $300 billion is left? Nobody really knows. Nobody, uh, Russia's central bank's not going to give us honest numbers. But Ukraine will win when there's an economic or political collapse inside of Russia. We don't know when that date will occur. But when it starts to happen, things are going to move very fast. Everybody's saying that Russia is never going to collapse. Russia can't collapse. Based on historical precedents, Russia is the most likely country in the world to collapse because they've done it twice in the last 100 years. It is something that I always tend to say, and that's very much in line with what you say, and that's that basically every war that Russia has lost was lost because their economy has fallen apart in the middle of the war. And they, they've they lost economically rather than militarily. But I guess the other side of that is that for Ukrainians, that basically means they just have to dig in and accept that the war might also go on for a very, very long time. Russia is doing Ukraine a favor. You know, this this stupid reinvasion of the Kharkiv Oblast, and they're taking eight to one casualties. It would be so much more difficult for Ukraine to cause these casualties if Russia was just dug in and not doing anything. The fact that there are these meat assaults every day to try and take Chasiv Yar or to try and go farther into the Donetsk Oblast. Russia is helping Ukraine with these stupid attacks uh, and, and, and just losing equipment, losing soldiers. I know it feels endless at the moment because we're right in the middle of it, but Russia is going to have a breaking point at some point in the future and things will collapse fast. So you think that 
actually in a way the war of attrition russia despite russia having a lot more resources in a way is actually more beneficial for ukraine uh, the idea that we can just give ukraine enough weapons where they can go on the offensive and retake all of their territory by force while russia is still conscripting more men and you know their factories are pumping out artillery shells and tanks as fast as possible in that scenario, that, that's horrendous for the Ukrainian military. When we saw Ukraine, you know, try and get through the Sorovikin line last summer, it, 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 it's just too difficult with all these uh, landmines and FPV drones and our precision artillery strikes. For Ukraine to go on the offensive while Russia is still economically healthy and regenerating combat readiness every single day, uh, I think that scenario still possible, but is le less likely than Russia just having uh, some kind of economic or political collapse back at home, and then their military doesn't want to do this anymore. This war ends if any if someone just puts a bullet in Putin's brain. By the way, the second Putin is no longer living, we're going to find a way to end this war. I I, I do think th the elites of Moscow are not happy with the sanctions. Solvyov can't visit his five villas that he owns in Italy. They're not happy about paying higher taxes, and they, they want to find a way out of this if they can get rid of Putin. Isn't that, and I, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here, isn't that sort of the way of thinking we've had since the beginning of the war, that we expect Russia to run out of money or that the Russian elites or the regular people are going to get fed up with what's going on. And we've expected that to happen much sooner, but it still didn't happen. And we might have to just wait a lot longer than we might think at this point. I forget who told me this. It might have been Vlad Vexler, but somebody told me at one point that uh, the superpower of the Russian people is they suffer incredibly well. They are willing to accept conditions and uh, treatments that no other decent human being or civilization would accept. Uh, so the threshold for suffering and pain by the Russians is extremely high. And that's not suffering and pain inflicted on them by their enemies. It's suffering and pain inflicted on them by their own governments, their own leadership. Uh, so yes, uh, I think there were a lot of expectations two and a half years ago. I'm guilty of it as well. We're going to kick some big Russian banks out of the SWIFT network. This is going to cause an economic calamity. Foreign investments all going to be pulled out. Russia will collapse within a month. I mean, I thought that going back two and a half years. Uh, but we underestimated the threshold of what Russians are willing to tolerate because it feels and sounds pretty intolerable when I watch these YouTube videos of Russians going to the grocery store or Russians in their small town that doesn't it's trash piled up everywhere and they don't have any basic government services. So yes, they have a th high threshold for pain, but things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse every single day. These utility disasters last winter were shocking for me. All these apartment blocks in Moscow without heat and electricity because pipes kept bursting. This winter is going to be worse. Nothing in Russia is getting better as Putin is spending all, all his money on tanks and bombs to just blow stuff up in Ukraine, which doesn't benefit the average Russian at all. Looking at it in that perspective, one of the ways out that Vladimir Putin is probably hoping for is the victory of Donald Trump, which could be one of the only realistic solutions for him to get out of this war with something that looks like a victory. There's 400 million people in Europe. If the United States completely withdrew or gave up, uh, I, I still think Europe can defend itself. Uh, I, I, it'd be a lot easier if America helped the Europeans uh, stop this Russian aggression, this resurgence of the Russians trying to regain control of Eastern Europe. Uh, but even if the United States, even if Trump wins and the United States abandons Ukraine, 
it's still not looking optimistic for the Russians in my perspective. What's your view on the Russian nuclear saber rattling of which I think we've seen once again a lot more um, in recent weeks. Do you see as someone who's actually worked in this field and in this branch of the military, do you see any realistic scenario in which Russia would actually seriously consider the use of their nuclear weapons? Uh, according to uh, Russian military doctrine, they can only use nuclear weapons if you know, the integrity of the state is being attacked or compromised. And at the moment, Putin has made himself indistinguishable from the state. Putin has declared himself czar of Russia for life, and he is Russia. So Putin views it as, if I'm threatened, I will use nukes. Uh, so I do believe that. I do believe that if Putin thinks there's a serious threat to his power, he would use nuclear weapons. But who's most likely to challenge him internally, and it's some other faction within Russia. So I think the most likely scenario of Russia using a nuclear weapon is against itself. It would, you know, if somebody like Prigozhin, some warlord, was doing a thunder run to Moscow to take control of the Kremlin, Putin would nuke that convoy. Uh, but as far as nuking a, a NATO city or using a nuke somewhere in Ukraine... There's no benefit. It doesn't help Russia achieve the victory in any capacity. So if Putin decided to use a nuclear weapon to destroy Odessa or destroy Kharkiv, would Ukraine surrender? I don't I don't think Ukraine would surrender. Would support for Ukraine go up in response to the first nuclear attack being used in war since World War II? Yeah, I think I think support for Ukraine would go up. Uh, I, I've made dedicated videos on this topic, but I'll give you the top two reasons why Russia can't use nuclear weapons. The first one is they don't know how the other nuclear powers would react, specifically India and China. China has explicitly told, uh, this is President Xi has explicitly told Putin, do not use nuclear weapons under any scenario. So if China and India participate in sanctions, that's lights out for Russia. Putin knows that. The second reason why Putin would never use a nuclear weapon is he's dead if he does. He's going to have to pick his favorite command bunker underground, and he'll never be able to come back to the surface. Because if he comes back to the surface, a Hellfire missile will be waiting for him. Uh, the only reason why Western agents, Western intelligence is not trying to assassinate Putin is because they think he's a rational actor who will not use nuclear weapons. The second the guy in charge of Russia starts using nukes, there's no reason to keep him alive anymore. Uh, that's a cleanup scenario that we're trying to avoid, but Putin's alive and he still gets to go on trips and parade around because he hasn't nu used a nuclear weapon. So you think that if in the scenario that Russia would use the, a nuclear weapon, do you think that the U.S. wouldn't actually have any other choice than to join the war on Ukraine's side? Uh, if, if Russia used a single nuclear weapon somehow, uh, NATO would get involved, but it would not respond with a nuclear weapon. Uh, it would use conventional forces to level Kaliningrad or sink the entire Black Sea fleets. Or, I mean, there's there's lots of kinetic responses that NATO would take. And honestly, they've had two and a half years to think hard about it and prepare for what they would do. There is a plan somewhere, and it would not be good for Russia. So this is why the Russians have not used a nuclear weapon in two and a half years, despite talking about it almost every single day on Kremlin State TV. I think I have to use the opportunity of you having you here with your expertise, because there's this um, opinion that I sometimes read on Twitter about Russian nuclear weapons and how, given how incompetent the rest of the military is, there's a chance that most of the nuclear weapons wouldn't actually work anyway, because they would be just as hollowed out and corrupt as the rest of the Russian military. What's your What's your view on that? I can speak uh, from my own personal experience working in the missile fields here in the United States. 
when I would uh, go on shifts in a launch control capsule, I, I had status monitoring of up to 50 uh, nuclear silos. And every single shift I took, alert I went on, at one of those 50 silos, something broke. Maintenance is continuous. There's so many moving parts and stuff that needs to be lubricated and checked and maintained and filters swapped out or whatever. At these 50 silos, I couldn't go 24 hours without something breaking. So when I think about Russia's nuclear uh, missile fields or their road mobiles or wherever they have their, uh, you know, their missiles hidden, stuff breaks all the time. And I don't understand why they would prioritize that maintenance when they have soldiers dying in Ukraine. You know, if, 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 if resources are finite, your attention is finite. Yeah, I imagine their nuclear forces, which aren't being used and can't be used, are being neglected. But what Russia makes up for in precision, they, they compensate with quantity. It doesn't matter if the failure rate on 6,000 nuclear weapons is 50%. They still have 3,000 functional nuclear weapons. So that's always been Russia's strategy. So we can't rely on them not working because they still have so many. I, I think talking about the U Ukraine's theory of victory in the war of attrition and how the West can make it possible to happen. In recent weeks, Ukraine is probably going to get their first F-16s and it has... Uh, received permission from the United States and from European countries to finally start hitting um, Russian targets on the Russian territory. Do you think there's anything more, any s substantial uh, capability that NATO member states could or should give to Ukraine um, that we're still not uh, doing? There's always a, a wish list, a, a dream sheet. I mean... Over the last two and a half years, we've crossed so many things off that the Western, the NATO alliance has said, no, we'll never send leopard tanks. No, we'll never send Patriot air defense systems. No, we'll never send attackums. Uh, so, I mean, what's currently on the list? Like what's on the wish list for people on Twitter to yell at our politicians? And uh, it's Taurus cruise missiles from Germany. Germany says they don't want to send it because they would have to send advisors or operators to Ukraine for those Taurus cruise missiles to work and just do it. I mean, maybe we got to get rid of Chancellor Schultz first, but just 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 send send the, the advisors or the operators so that Ukraine can start using Taurus cruise missiles. Uh, the other restriction people want lifted today is the use of attackums up to 300 kilometers into Russian territory. I don't know if President Biden ever is, is ever going to uh, allow that, but I mean, that's at this point, I don't think anything's off the table. We're sending NATO soldiers to Ukraine. That used to be a red line even two months ago. So uh, yeah, I think, I mean, if we're still a year from now where we are, Taurus cruise missiles will have been sent, you know, within the next year. And Attackums missiles will get the green light to be used up to 300 kilometers into Russian territory. What else is on the list? And I mean, we're not given Ukraine submarines or <laughs> I, I don't know. There is there's a lot of ordnance and missiles that can be fit to an F-16. And we've not had any discussions yet which ones are OK and which ones are not. Because F-16s haven't arrived yet. But as soon as Ukraine is actually flying F-16s, everyone's going to get out the sheet of the dozens of different missile types that can fit under an F-16. And they're going to say, have we sent that? Why haven't we sent that? We know we got some of these. I don't care how far it goes or can it be used on the territory of Russia. Give Ukraine, you know, those AMRAMs or whatever, whatever missile type can fit on an F-16. That's the next debate that's coming. And you've mentioned another threshold, which would be the deployment of NATO troops. And, and so far, we're talking about non-combat uh, capacity in Ukraine. Do you think that could be a game changer or would it be, w will there be a moment when we're not going to even be talking about non-combat uh, capacities? Because 
that's still that still has a limited impact and we would be talking about sending nato troops that would directly participate in combat i think this was just said two weeks ago that if for some reason russia were to experience a significant breakthrough on the front lines poland said they would just go into ukraine i'm personally in favor of poland just doing this now I mean, if, if, if the people of Poland actually believe a war with Russia is inevitable, then you might as well fight it now on Ukraine's territory and not your own territory. Uh, so I, 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 I do think that NATO combat forces at some point in the future probably will enter the war uh, to fight only on the territory of Ukraine. I know that's hard to imagine now but if for some reason this war is still going on two or three years from now everyone will be exhausted and tired of this and yeah it, it's it's going to happen what we're doing now we're sending logisticians maintainers trainers medical workers these are support roles just send them you know estonia finland poland whoever wants to go if you don't want to go don't go if if italy and belgium don't want their NATO military forces to go to Ukraine, they don't have to. This is this is a voluntary choice. Would you send U.S. soldiers? I think there's already some U.S. Uh, military personnel in Ukraine. Uh, as far as trainers or advisors, yes. But combat forces, no. I, I, I don't see the United States ever sending, um, you know, army privates to fight in a trench in the Donbass region. I don't think that's going to happen. Thank you for listening to this conversation. If you'd like to hear the rest of it, you can find it on my Patreon. Click the link in the description or go to patreon.com slash decoding geopolitics. And if you decide to become a supporter, you get bonus content, Patreon-only episodes, and you will be able to ask questions to my future guests.